God bless you. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Listen, we believe that it was the divine hand of God that led you here right now. We know that there's a word for you. This is all we need you to do. Open your ears, open your mind, and let God into your heart and see what the word is today. Come on, let's go into sanctuary. Amen. I am excited about the Word of God this week. We're going to be continuing the series of sermons we've been preaching and teaching together under the general rubric of fire drills. You know, it's an interesting thing. You know, fire drills go both ways. We've been talking about, you know, some of the things from fire drills. We talked about, you know, stop, drop, and roll, and we talked about following instructions. But that, that's what happens on our end. I still remember when I was a little kid, one of my favorite field trips. Y'all remember field trips? Field trips was when they would take you somewhere outside of school so you could see something out in the real world. And we went to a fire station. And when we went to the fire station, I still remember all of it. They let us play on the trucks. They let us, you know, we slid down the pole. You know, I thought that that was just something that was on TV. There are real, well, at least then, there were real poles in firehouses. And they let us slide down the pole, and it was all great. And this is the thing that they told us. You know, we practice all the time just in case there's a fire. What was inter what's interesting about that is we know what we do on a fire drill, but do you realize that the fire department does fire drills as well? At every fire station, they go through all the things that they have to do so that when a fire breaks out, they are ready to go and do their part. Firefighters, when they do their drills, it's real simple. The alarm goes off and they've got to get up, get dressed, get out, fight the fire, and then the last part, get themselves back home. So they practice all of that because when you're putting on all that fire gear, you can't be stumbling and fumbling. You got places to be, things to do, fires to put out. So the firemen, they drill on how to drop down, get in their gear, get on the truck, and get to going. And I'm glad they do it because it means that they can respond when there's a fire. But I want you to realize that as believers, we are on both ends of the fire drill. We are on the end of the drill where we may be in the fire, but guess what? As believers, we are also called to be firefighters. I want you to understand that firefighters are, have to be brave. They have to run towards fire instead of away from it. They have special training and they have special gear. For us as believers, there may be times in life when the alarm is going to go off and God is going to call us and he's going to send us to do his work, his will, and his way. And I want you to know there are going to be times in life when God is going to call you, the alarm is going to go off, and God is going to give you an assignment on your your life that will send you into harm's way. Understand something. Firefighters are brave. If you're going to be a believer, if you're going to follow God, if you're going to be on mission for God, you've got to be brave. God is not calling us to sit back and just enjoy the things of life. God is also calling us to move into the things of life, move into situations, move into issues, move into problems, and be a part of it. Notice, you have to be brave, but you also have to run towards the fire instead of running away from it. Too many times in life, we'll do the, that's not my problem. Understand, when we become believers, we don't take on the problems of the world, but we try to spread salt and light. We try to bring the word of God and the kingdom of God into every situation we're in. That doesn't mean you got to be obnoxious. That doesn't mean you got to be Bible toting and Bible thumping and always quoting scriptures. But it does mean that you have to live a life that allows folk to see your God through you. Understand, they also have special training. Firefighters have special training so they can know how to get people in and out of buildings, how to knock down doors, how to put out different types of fires. As believers, we have special training. We have training in prayer. We have training in the word. We have training in worship so that we are ready at all times. And here's the thing, they have special gear. I want you to know some of the most special gear that we have as believers is our worship. You've got to be ready to worship. Worship is not just an event. Worship is something you've got to carry with you so that you're ready to use it at all times. I want you to know I've gone through all of this to let you know that the topic for my sermon today is you've got to be fireproof. 
Here's the thing about being fireproof. Being fireproof simply means that you have the ability to go in and withstand fire or great heat. This is the thing. The One of the things about the special gear that firemen have is that it's all fireproof. They don't run into a building just wearing cotton and wearing polyester. They have flame retardant fireproof things so that in the midst of fire, they are still relatively safe because the gear that they have will protect Protect them in the midst of the fire. And I want you to know, when you're on assignment from God, there will be times that you will have to run into the midst of the fire and you got to be fireproof. I want you to write it in the comments right now. I'm fireproof. And I know some of you are like, whoa, I'm not sure. I'm fireproof. What do you mean I'm fireproof? This is what you have to understand. The reason you need special training is so you can understand the gear that you have. The reason you need special training is so that you can understand all that you come with. Here's the thing. We haven't learned everything that we need to know because sometimes we miss the things that God is teaching us. Here it is. Bible tells us the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, to be familiar to some of you, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This is what I want you to realize. Too many of us quote the, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me without realizing that part of it is understanding the beginning of what Paul is saying. Two times he says it. Be real careful. Look at what the Bible says. He, is, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And then again, he says, watch this. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I want you to know what Paul was essentially saying is, I've learned to be fireproof. I want you all to know that Paul learned to be fireproof because Paul's contentment came from the ability to survive no matter how hot it got. Here's the thing about the Bible. You've got to put the entire Bible together to understand how deep the Bible goes. The book, of Philipp, the book of Philippians is written to the church at Philippi. Now, here's the thing. Paul planted the church at Philippi, but you've got to understand how Paul got to Philippi. When you read the book of Philippians, it's not just written to random people. It's written to a church of people that Paul already knew. It's written to a church of people who already knew part of Paul's story. And this is what you've got to understand about Paul's story. When and Paul tells them, I've learned to be content. Watch this. He's telling them out of the experience that he had in Philippi. To understand what happened to Paul in Philippi, you've got to go over to the book of Acts. When you go over to the book of Acts, meet me there in the 16th chapter. I just want to give you a little bit from Acts chapter 16. This is what you need to know. Paul has been looking for a place to go. Paul has been looking for a place to spread the word. Paul has been waiting for, for his new assignment from God. And this is what the word of God tells us in Philippians chapter 16. Uh, meet me in verse, verse 6. This is what Paul says. Paul and his this is what the Bible says. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Understand, Paul gets his new assignment. In other words, an alarm goes off. Paul is trying to do this, that, and the other, but an alarm goes off in the form of a dream. God comes to him and says, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. He sends a dream of a man in Macedonia saying, please 
come to us. I want y'all to understand. Never underestimate the fact that God is talking to you. Never underestimate the fact that God is trying to trouble your soul sometimes. Never underestimate the fact that sometimes when you're reading the Bible and it starts to get hot and you start saying, whoa, I'm not sure. Let me close it. That's God trying to get your attention. There are sometimes in dreams, God is trying to prick your heart to move you in a direction. There are sometimes when you hear a song, when you get a word during the worship service, God is trying to call you and call your attention to send you on assignment. Here's what I want you to understand. you got to answer the alarm because you're a firefighter and you're going to be fireproof. Let me help. Sometimes we don't want to answer the alarm simply because we're afraid of going. I want you to know you don't have to be afraid of going on God's assignment. You just have to understand the assignment. Many times we're afraid because we don't think it's going to work out well. What I want you to understand is that it's not that it's not going to work out well. It just may not be easy. It may not be luxurious because here's the problem. Be real clear. Sometimes following God will lead you into trouble. Anybody here ever been in trouble because they were following God? They were just trying to do the word, the work of God. They were just trying to do the will of God. They were just trying to be on assignment and it still got them in trouble. I want you to realize God doesn't promise a trouble-free life. God promises I will be with you as long as you're on your assignment. I want somebody to know right now, it's time to pick up your assignment. Drop it in the comments for me right now. Pick up your assignment. You've got to pick up your assignment. You gotta pick up your assignment because there are people depending on you. You gotta pick up your assignment because there are people that need you. You gotta pick up your assignment because God has called you. God has equipped you and God is ready to send you. But watch this, your assignment won't be about you. Notice, in the dream, Paul is not promised glory. Paul is not promised a platform. Paul is simply told, go here and preach the word. Go here and do what you're told. And this is what I want you to understand. When Paul gets there, he finds his, he finds his assignment. He starts preaching. And the Bible tells us that a woman named Lydia and her friends, they become believers. They get baptized. They, that's how the church starts in Macedonia. Now, what I want you to understand is that the capital of Macedonia, the biggest the biggest city there is the city of Philippi. I told y'all it all comes back together. Oh, remember, Paul has written to the church at Philippi, but Paul was also sent to Philippi. Macedonia is the, st is the state, the country. Philippi is the city in Macedonia. And here's the thing. Paul gets there. He preaches. Lydia and them become saved, and they become part of the church. They even invite Paul to stay with them. But here's the problem. The person that called him in the dream wasn't a woman, it was a man. So Paul is still there and he's still preaching and here's where the problem comes in. Following God to get you in trouble because watch what happens. Paul is trying to follow God. Paul is simply trying to do what the Lord said and the Bible tells us that Paul has been walking around and this girl who has a spirit of divination is how the King James says it. She sees the spirit on Paul. She sees the Lord on Paul's life. And she cries out after them day and night. These are servants of the Lord. Until Paul finally turns around and the Bible says he frees her of that spirit. And now she can no longer proclaim things. But here's the problem. The owners of that girl, because she was a slave, were making money off of her power of divination. And when she couldn't divine stuff anymore, when she couldn't tell futures anymore, when they couldn't make a profit off of her anymore, a funny thing happened. Oh, they got mad at who? Not the girl. They got mad at Paul because Paul was messing up their money. Can I tell you, when you're following God, you may mess up some stuff for other folk. And the problem is when you mess up other people's stuff, they may get mad at you. They may have a fit with you. They may go after you. And you've got to be ready for that because the truth of the matter is God didn't say it would be easy. God said he would be with you. And you've got to remember you're fireproof. I know y'all are saying, where, where does this fireproof thing come from? Where does this fireproof thing mean? This is what I want you to understand. This is what the Bible says, moving down uh, Acts chapter 16. 
I, I'm going to give you the whole story from the Bible. Look, watch this. Acts chapter 16. Once when they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit which predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Watch this. The girl sees the power of God on them. The girl sees the assignment they've been sent on. But she's becoming a nuisance. The Bible tells us she followed Paul, the rest of us. She makes these proclamations. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, not to the girl, to the spirit in her. Because the spirit that was in her was not of her. In the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. But when the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities, brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews who are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating for customs unlawful to us as Romans to accept or practice. Then the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Look at this. They're just following what God told them to do. And look at what happens. They get lied on, they get beaten, and they get thrown in jail. Can I help somebody? You think that just because folk have said something bad behind your back, you should give up what God called you to do. Everybody that they call, that God calls gets lied on. Everybody that God uses gets people talking about them. Everybody that God uses, it comes with haters. It comes with gossip. It comes with sleepless nights. It comes with folk bothering you. It comes with folk lying on It comes with that. I want you to write in the comments, it comes with that. Understand, if you are going to follow the things of God, it's going to come with some stuff. Paul and Silas get beaten and thrown in jail. And I know some of y'all said, I thought you said we was fireproof. That wasn't the fire. Here's the problem. If that was the fire, it would have burned them up. Remember, Paul said, I've learned to be content because I'm fireproof. In other words, the beating didn't take them out. The flogging didn't take them out. The lies didn't take them out. The arrest didn't take them out. And here it is. Verse 25. About... Midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. I want you to understand the special gear that Paul and Silas had that made them fireproof because they had gone through the flogging, they had gone through the lies, they had gone through the torture. When they were in jail, the hottest of the hot, they hadn't broken down because remember, being fireproof means that you can withstand extreme heat and fire. They're now in the midst of the fire and what do they do? They bring out their special gear. I want you to understand the special gear that we have that keeps us fireproof, the special gear that we have that moves back the enemy, the special gear that we have that keeps us from getting burned up is our praise, our prayers, and our worship. When you've got your praise, your prayers, and your worship, you've already become fireproof. Psalm 34 verse 1 simply says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Understand, Paul is in jail after having been lied on, beaten, and arrested. He's in jail with Silas, and they start praying and singing songs of glory. Let me ask you something. What do you do when you're in trouble? Because if we're real honest, many of us panic. Some of us start cussing. Some of us want to fight fire with fire. They talked about me, I'm going to talk about them. They tried to take me out, I'm going to try to take them out. Paul and Silas said, no, we got special gear. We're going to pray 
And we're going to sing songs to the Lord. I want you to realize your worship is your weapon. Your worship is your special gear. And that's why you got to practice these fire drills so that you can be fireproof. Your fireproofing is when you learn to worship no matter what. I want somebody to know you got to worship no matter what. Drop it in the comments. Worship no matter what. When I say worship no matter what, you got to worship in good times and in bad times. You got to worship when you feel like it. And you got to worship when you don't feel like it. Understand, too often we may worship simply emotion. In other words, I just don't feel like worshiping today. I don't feel like watching the broadcast today. I don't feel like singing the songs today. It ain't my song no way. You've got to understand that when you practice your worship so that you can be fireproof, you begin to realize that I don't care if it's my song because I'm not singing for me. I'm singing for God. I don't care if I don't feel like worshiping because the thing about worship is that worship is a posture of the body and a posture of the heart. It's when I don't feel like worshiping that I know I need to worship the most because when I don't feel like it watch this means I've forgotten how good God has been if you ever want to feel like worshiping think about how good God has been to you if you ever want to feel like worshiping think about the times that you should have been taken out think about the times when you should have been dead think about the times when you should have fallen apart think about the times when you should have lost your mind but God kept you God preserved you God sustains you I feel like shouting right now because when I think about about what God has done my worship begins to come out because it makes me remember that it's not about me it's about a God that's so good that nothing going on around me can burn me because I remember what God has done worship watch this is an act of gratitude understand when you just remember what God has done it should lead you to worship when you remember how he made a way out of no way, it should lead you to worship. Can I take it a step further? When you realize that you're still here right now, it should lead you to worship. With all that's going on in the world, with a pandemic, with racial strife, with social strife, with international conflict, with all that's going on, the fact that you're still here is a reason to work. When Paul said, I've learned to be content, he was simply saying, I've seen it all and I'm still here, so I've got to worship him. I want you to understand, Paul and Silas at midnight are worshiping. This is what I want you to understand about midnight. Midnight is when the shift happens. Midnight is when we go from night to day. Midnight is when we go from p.m. to a.m. Midnight is when the flip comes. And I want you to know that in your midnight hour, I'm not going to say God is going to turn around. I want you to know in your midnight hour, you've got to praise, you've got to pray, and you've got to worship. In your midnight hour, watch this, you won't realize that the switch has happened until the midnight has passed and suddenly you'll have gone from night into day and all you'll realize is that I was worshiping the whole time. I want you to understand when you decide to worship the whole time, you'll move forward, you'll move, you'll move boldly, you'll move gladly. And here's the thing, when night turns into day, you'll still have something to celebrate because you were celebrating at night and now it's day. Here it is. Midnight can be the turning point that turns everything around. There are turning points all the time. You know, I've been doing some studies on great battles. You know, there were turning points in every war. In, in, in the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Saratoga in the fall of 1777 is when the revolutionaries had pushed back the British so far that they realized that they were going to win the war. In, in, um... <laughs> In the Civil War, Civil War, Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st through 3rd, 1863, the Confederates were going to invade the North and deal a blow to the North, winning the war, but they could not do it. The Battle of Gettysburg, when they couldn't invade the North and got pushed back by the Union, it was the turning point in the war that pushed the Confederates back into the South and led ultimately to the Union victory. In, 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 in World War II, 
Uh, there was a turning point, the Battle of Stalingrad, when, when Hitler tried to invade Russia and the, and the Russian army turned back the great threat of the German army marching on them because the Germans weren't prepared to make it through winter. That was the turning point on the Eastern Front of World War II. I want you to understand, I'm talking to you about turning points because when you start to worship, you'll hit your turning point. I know some of you are going through. I know some of you have had bad times. I know some of you, your money is funny. I know some of you, your health got bad. I know some of you, you like me, you lost people in this time. I know some of you, you felt like you were losing your mind. I know some of you are lonely. I know some of you just want to cry. And what I want you to know is that when you start to worship, it'll be your turning point. It'll be the turning point that switches day to, that switches night to day. It'll be the turning point that switches tears to smiles. It'll be the turning point that moves you instead of going backwards to moving you going forward. Your worship will make your turning point. About midnight, Paul and Silas are singing. And everything turns. How do I know everything turns? Look what the Bible says. They're singing at about midnight. And look what the word says. It is. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Here it is. Two things I want you to know from this part of the passage. When the shift happens at midnight, the doors open up. The chains fall. And here's the thing, they fall off for Paul and Silas and for everybody connected to them. Because the Bible says that the other prisoners were listening and watching. Understand, part of your testimony is your worship in rough times. When you worship in rough times, other people can see your chains falling off, so their chains be, begin to fall off. They start looking at you saying, I know what they're going through. If they can make it through that, I can make it through this. Your worship is your testimony that the devil doesn't get to win. Your worship is your testimony that tough times won't take you out. Your worship is your testimony that God can open any door, break any chain, and get you free. But here it is. Paul sees the shift, but he remembers the assignment. Remember, the assignment was a man in Macedonia, Philippi, calling them to come preach the word. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and trembling before Silas, he brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? This was the man that they answered the alarm for. This was the man who needed to hear the word of God. This was the man who had been crying out that God sent Paul on assignment for. And here it is. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all of his household were baptized. Look at it. Paul remembered the assignment, but he was fireproof long enough to get to the end. I want you to know. Paul stays on his assignment, preaches the word, and the jailer washes his wounds. I want you to understand, your special equipment is your worship. It makes you fireproof. It gives you the ability to stay on assignment even when the assignment gets rough. It gives you the ability to fulfill what God has called you to even when you feel like giving up. Don't let your feelings push you so far away from fulfilling what God has for you. You've got to have the ability to worship in the midst of it all. Because that's how you remain fireproof. When the devil turns up the heat, turn up your worship. When times get tough, tighten up your worship. That is your weapon. That is your special gift. That is your special gear that keeps you in the midst of the fire. 
My brothers, my sisters, Paul said, I've learned to be content. You learn by doing. And I want to tell you, you got to worship at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. For the assignment that God has for your life, you're going to need special gear. You're going to need the gear of worship so you can stay on your assignment. Hey, I hope that sermon enlivened your mind, opened your heart, and led you just a little bit closer to God. Listen, if the sermon had an effect on you, maybe that's God reaching out to you. Maybe that's God saying, it's time for you and I to connect. If you want more information about God, or if you want to be saved, or just to get more information about being saved, or if you want prayer or to become a part of the St. Paul family, we just want you to go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Contact Us button, and we'll get right back in contact with you for prayer, for salvation, or to be a part of the St. Paul family. Listen, let me ask you a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure that you know every time we put out a video so that you can be a part of the St. Paul family. And if you don't mind, copy the link and share it with some folk. If the word was great for you, the word will be great and a blessing to somebody else. If you enjoyed what we're doing, we'd love to have your support for the St. Paul Ministries. To support us, all you've got to do is go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Give button. It doesn't matter if you give a lot or if you give a little, but all of your support helps, all of your support counts, and all of your support helps us spread the word of God. Thanks for joining us. Remember, hit that subscribe button, and now it's time for the Williams Weekly Challenge. The word of God tells us to not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. Let me ask you a question. Do you understand your assignment from God? Here's the thing. Each and every one of us has an assignment from God. We have something that God put us here to do, something that God put us here to accomplish. But many times we waste a lot of time doing a lot of different things because we don't understand the assignment. This week, I want you to take some time with God and simply ask him, God, what's my assignment? Understand, it may not be a huge assignment, but it's huge in God's world because it'll make a difference in this world. But make sure that you know what it is. This week's challenge, real simple. Spend some time with God so you can understand your assignment. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next time.